Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running Virtual Roundtable, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of the stuff that we are putting on our feet. Today, we have the usual crew, minus Nathan. We have myself. We have Dr. Matthew Klein, PT, DPT, PhD, FAOMPT, and more. Don't read all that out. (laughs) And we also have a special guest on who is also a physical therapist. So we're all PTs today. Um, Ryan Wooderson, also known as the Long Run Physio. Thanks for coming on, man. Oh, thanks for having me, fellas. I appreciate it. Well, as we get going here, we do like to give you a little bit of a spotlight, get your background. Like, what is your background, your journey to becoming a PT? What is it that you do now, your passions, and, and why do you love running? Yeah. Uh, so I've been a runner for a long time, like like a lot of us have, and I'm sure a lot of listeners are. Um, and I didn't immediately come to PT like some folks did. I, I got into undergrad thinking med school was going to be my direction. And um, it just wasn't that to make the short story story short and wound up in PT after a while. Um, So I think I was exposed to it more because some friends were getting into it and I hadn't had any prior exposure to it other than that. So I checked it out and loved it. And here I am. So been a PT for 10 years. (laughs) started out um, doing a lot of of persistent pain, chronic pain, um, spine stuff. And then a couple years in, it just kind of clicked. I'm like, I am a runner. I love runners. I understand them well. I want to kind of dig deeper um, and figure out how to help runners better, more efficiently, more effectively. Um, And that's been my track, my personal track for probably like the last... uh, seven or eight years or so. So still learning, still doing all the time. I personally love it. I feel like the profession of physical therapy to some degree is a little bunch of misfits that found their way to PT. Like everyone had a different course. It feels like in a lot of ways, like there's very few people that are like, I want to do PT like straight from like high school. For sure. Yeah. I was the rare one. <laughs> I like Ryan. You, right, you touched, maybe... Yeah, I like that you touched on the fact that you understand runners. I think that's something that I'm finding repeatedly is people will come to us or other running physical therapists or other, other running practitioners. For the listeners out there, if you really want somebody to understand what you're doing, you better make sure the practitioner, whoever it is, is a runner. Because if not, they're probably not going to st- understand what you're doing. So just want to throw that out there. It's awesome that you do that because then you can be able to support and understand what their goals are and go, yeah, because I also do this. I, I get this. And that, that connection is so important for people. 100%. Yeah. And if anybody watches this and would like to see Ryan, Ryan, where are you based out of? I'm in the Denver metro. Uh, so I practice in Denver proper. I live in the, in the suburbs uh, like everybody else these days. So... I'm right in the heart of Denver, about two blocks from the, the Capitol building. Sweet. Awesome. So the Denver peeps, if you uh, <laughs> if you ever need someone to go to, we got you. Um, well, cool. Well, the topic of today for the podcast will be recovery. I feel like you can't get a group of physical therapists together and not talk recovery or rehab to some degree. So um, how do you define or what do you think of when you think of the word recovery? Oh, God. Um it's such it's a huge umbrella it's a huge <laughs> umbrella and it's it's a little bit of a pandora's box these days uh, because i think folks outside of our realm don't always understand it well our being like providers for runners whether it's a physician or a pt or whomever uh, we tend to understand what recovery actually means and general public i don't think we've fully gotten our message out as to what recovery actually is. It's very easy to glom on to things like foam rolling and, and whatever else that like, yeah, I'm going to stretch for 30 seconds after my run or whatever. And and we're going to call that recovery and pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Um, what, what recovery means to me is, um, it's everything that happens from one activity to the next everything that happens from one activity to the next. So from a run on Tuesday to your next run on Wednesday, how you're sleeping, how you're eating, how you're hydrating, what the rest of your movement looks like in between those times, what the rest of your life 
looks like from work and family and stress and all those things, all of that in my head and probably some other things too is wrapped up into this like giant recovery burrito um, that can get really full and feel really overwhelming. Like, holy shit, how am I ever gonna like tackle this thing? This five pound burrito. Um, but we need to understand what, what the center of the burrito is and then what actually matters and what constitutes the bulk of that burrito. I'm really hammering that analogy, I guess. Um, but uh, that's well, fine. Gonna... I hammer tacos, you hammer burritos. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like burritos. I like, <laughs> I, I like burritos. <laughs> Big fan. Anyway, uh, those are the things that I think, uh, <laughs> when I think about recovery is everything that happens from, from one activity to the next. Right. What is, what is I love that? that analogy. Yeah, I, I like that because it gives you a sense of consistency and it gives you kind of a bigger picture than just like, hey, I took a protein shake within 30 minutes of running or doing an activity or like you said, eating a meal. Like it's a much bigger concept to that. And it's almost more of a lifestyle, it seems like. But I think for people that are not very experienced in athletics specifically, I think they kind of struggle with this. Like, how does someone know they're recovering properly? Right. Um, is that a hypothetical question or, or is that actually like... It, it it's really like, is both. both. I mean, yeah. Yeah, like, like as someone who isn't very experienced, because I mean, if you're really well in tune with your body, there's certain warning signs that come up. And if you've been doing something long enough, you can recognize that with yourself. But for, for sure. someone who hasn't gotten those lifetime miles and they're just not really sure and they're still feeling out the waters, what are some basic things they can look for or uh, incorporate to just feel like they are, that they're recovered and recovering? Yeah. So that's an excellent point. Like once you do this for a while, you get an understanding of how your body is responding and how it is recovering. And you get a, a very good feel for that if you are choosing to listen. Um, for the folks who are newer to the scene or, or just understanding what recovery actually means, the biggest things I ask folks to focus on are sleep and nutrition more than anything. Like, don't worry about all the fluff because with recovery, again, this burrito, there's a lot of fluff in there. There can't be anyway, right? Um, the biggest things, the, the, the meat of the thing is sleep and nutrition massively. So all of us should be getting somewhere in between seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Right. And, and I say should, because life is life. It does weird things. You know, some of us are doing PhDs, not me hand, not raised. Um, some of us were dumb enough to do this. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Just send yourself to the shadow realm for yeah. a while and <laughs> yeah. sacrificing yourself to make the rest of us smarter. So thanks for that. <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, life is life and we can't control all of the variables. So you need to make the effort consistently kind of like you said, David earlier is like the consistency is the biggest thing. So try and make the effort to get in that seven to nine hour range as many nights during the week as you possibly can. And then also making sure that while you are putting out more physical effort, you know, especially in the beginning of your training making sure your calories are, are adequate. Um, and you know, the next question off of that is, well, how do I know that the calories are adequate? You should have some sort of feel for that as just a human on the planet. But my best advice is to contact a local registered dietitian and they can help you dial those things for you. Not necessarily for weight loss or overall health, though those could be goals for a person, but just to know that like, hey, here's the physical effort that I'm putting forth from week to week. How can I make sure that I'm getting the calories that I need to replenish my body from these efforts? Like those are the questions to ask the, the registered dietitian um, because it's hard to know. It's hard to know. And there's a lot of math and science to it that we don't always have access to as, as a general public. That's yeah, really I agree want. completely. And there's so much uh, just individualistic properties to this where people respond differently to different things. And it's not just X plus Y equals Z. 
And I guess that also like is a spinoff question off the sleep. So if we're shooting for seven to nine hours um, per day, is are those hours, are they all weighed equally? Like, let's say if someone goes to bed at nine o'clock versus 11 o'clock versus 1 a.m., I feel like in our society, everything is so up and down. You know, there's some people that on a very regular basis, they do go to bed beyond midnight, you know? And for me, I, I'm out by like 930. I can't hang. That's like, if I'm up at 10, you know, I'm in a dazed state. So <laughs> um, just a general question. I'm not sure what the right answer is on that one. So, David, are you referring to sleep schedules, right, in terms of timing? Right? Yeah, to sleep schedules, because it kind yeah. of falls back on the individual as well on that one. But I'm curious to see what you think, Ryan. Yeah, I think there is some individuality to this. Like some folks are just they're they're wired to have more alertness, more focused attention at later points in the day than other folks. So they feel more energy feel like they have more energy later in the day and it's harder for them to you know shut the lights off at nine o'clock like you and i do david like holy crap if i'm up at 10 you know there's something going on it's weird so I, that's just how i'm geared um so is there a little bit of fluctuation there in terms of like when people should go to sleep but yes absolutely um to your question of are there different weights to when we get those hours? I do believe there are. Um, you know, I encourage people to read into uh, a fellow I came on to. Uh, his name is Matthew Walker. And he is uh, an insanely smart person. At, I think he teaches at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. He's got a couple of really good books and he's on a bunch of different podcasts talking about the weight of those hours, because if we sleep from one to say eight, the hours from six to eight probably carry different weight for a different individual than they would for that same individual, the hours of four to six, right? So what matters again is the person and when they feel like they have the most energy and when they feel like they are actually tired and having a routine around that to say, okay, here's like my hour. I ask folks to try and at least get 30 minutes of a ramp down time, if not an hour mm -hmm. of ramp from the day, whatever they've been doing, studying, reading, playing with their family, whatever, all the things working, especially to just get themselves to a state where they actually feel tired or feel a little bit more relaxed. So their body can like do all the hormonal things that it needs to do to cause them to sleep at an appropriate time. Because there's a lot of neuroscience to this and a lot of hormonal science to this that I'm not going to pretend like I know all of it. Um, but I know enough to help people and enough to be dangerous with this information. So yeah, that's routine is huge. That's a great answer. I couldn't say it any better myself. I, I agree completely. And there are, I mean, there are a whole field of sleep science. Like people are going on deep, deep dives, like you said, on the neurological side, the hormonal side and all of those. And if you're interested in those, you can find resources on that as well. And we might be able to go divvy up a couple too, um, just to put in the, the notes. But um, to shift it back more, go for it. Yeah. I, I really, I, Ryan, I really appreciate you bringing up Matthew Walker. His, his lab over at UC Berkeley is part of the psychology department because, like you said, this is all neuroscience, right? It's not, it's not just your body, but brain, your brain tissue, right? That also is what really, really recovers during sleep. So whether you're doing physical or mental performance, and actually the two of them do interact very heavily, and we knew that mm -hmm. through part of his lab and some other research, that sleep becomes very important. And how you're getting into that is really key. Um, you've probably done this, and I, as someone who works in a spine and persistent pain center at Kaiser, you know, getting, trying to get people on more consistent sleep schedules, even if they don't fall asleep, there are things that happen even while you're getting ready to go to sleep that can help prep you. People don't know that. They'll be on their phone, jump right in to bed and go, why am I not falling asleep? It's like, oh yeah. well, because sleep is not as simple as you think. There's a, it's like, you know, do you go, do you go out the door for your run and literally just jump into six minute pace? I hope not. I've seen people do that. It doesn't end well, but you need okay. to prep just like you would any other activity. And I think it's because people don't really realize how important sleep is. People just think, oh, it's this time that I'm wasting. It's like, it's not, you know, and I think what would be helpful for our listeners talking about why is, I know we kind of touched around this, but like, 
why is sleep important? What is it? There. Oh my God. Um, yeah. Right. We, we, <laughs> such a big question. Um, yeah. there's so many things that happen to our bodies in a positive way when we're getting quality sleep, right? Um, brain cells healing and repairing themselves and reproducing themselves, muscular cells doing the same thing in terms of all the hormones and neurotransmitters that are involved there. Like there's just a massive, massive amount of, of healing and regeneration that happens on a very cellular level when we sleep and sleep well and sleep well consistently. There's just not enough that can be said about it. Again, we could go on for weeks probably about that. And, you know, I would have to open up Matthew Walker's book to talk more intelligently about it. Um, but it's a great book, by the way, it's just, a great book. I encourage it. It, it is. And if you get the audio book, listening to him speak is just a treat. It is a treat. I would listen to that man and read the phone book. I really would. It's great. He's got a great vo voice. <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too. Uh, from the neurological standpoint, when we look at this, our bodies are so good at adapting. We're just like this moldable Play-Doh that if you just push it in certain ways, it will respond. And that can go for you and against you. And so like, if your sympathetic nervous system like is wired up, you're like, you're on your phone, everything's going, you have all this white light and everything's all riled up and excited. How can you go to sleep? And a lot of people that have a lot of sleeping problems they're on their bed, they're on their phone while they're trying to go to sleep and they're scrolling through Instagram, they're commenting on posts. And yeah, I think it's good to have that ramp down time. And I think in the bigger picture th of things, not only in just over one night of a good night of sleep, but multiply that over seven days a week, you'd be amazed on how you feel going forward. Um, another thing that's real important too is also nutrition. And you touched on this earlier. Um, I think you hit it pretty well with the burrito analogy, but I would also like to link it back in with like, say the active recovery of things. So do you think that having any meals before you run, does that impact your recovery afterwards and having meals after your run, does that impact uh, recovery afterwards? So meals before and after, uh, I think meals before are every bit as important or, or some sort of nutritional intake before is every bit as important as nutritional intake afterwards. If you think about say like a weekend long run where you're running probably an hour plus for some people, sometimes you need that immediate hit of calories after about 30 to 40 minutes, right? Your body starts working through other metabolic systems and you start burning the candle, you know, metaphorically at both ends. So you need a little bit of extra calories in your body so you can sustain your desired effort for a longer period of time, right? And then after, of course, the run, whatever run it is, doesn't matter which one, to replenish the, the, the I'm gonna use the phrase damage because that's physiologically what happens during hard efforts, yeah. right? Like muscular damage and all the things it's a, it's a loaded phrase, but to repair, to help repair the damage or harm that's been done to our tissues by running, by the impact of running, by the volume and load of running that it requires. And so if we have that protein intake, especially at least, you know, typical understanding is within like half an hour, of the run or at least, you know, life being life again, within an hour of that run, you're going to give yourself the best nutritional uh, opportunity to recover from that run. So both meals on either end are important. Now, what people feel comfortable with taking in before and after is a totally subjective thing as well. Like I'm someone I ran unintentionally fasted for years and not really on purpose, just sort of like, yeah, yeah, Matthew, you understand too. Like, it's just how I did it. I don't like wish I didn't. I yeah. Wish, wish I didn't, but that's what we did. I've been there. It, it just makes it so much harder. And when I realized like I can take in just like a little bit, like half a banana and a little bit of peanut butter, 
man, I feel so much better at like the 40 to 45 minute mark than if I haven't taken in anything. I don't like stuff being in my stomach when I run. I don't feel good about it. That's just my baseline. So I've learned to kind of take in just a little bit and what, what helps fuel me. Everybody needs a little bit of something before a run. Any registered dietitian will tell you that. And, and it matters very much physiologically. Yeah, and I've, they, they, I've used my own body as a human science experiment multiple times on this exact topic. And I do find just having a little bit of a carbon protein storage, just a small one. We're not talking anything big, but just having a little something before you get going. Like you said, right around that time when you start to tap into that blood glucose, you know, like that 30 to 45 minute range, like start feeling like I feel better and uh, I, I can keep going. And today was one of those days when I did experiment with that, had a long run with a long tempo session in the middle of it, felt good. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was dying. And like it, a lot of times when I, I'm still doing this human experiment, by the way, like still trying to dial in nutrition and figure out what works best for me. Cause ultimately it, if you practice it and you execute it on race day and things like that, you can, it's a much smoother process. And so some days you go fasted and it doesn't quite work out. And some days you eat too much and it doesn't work out. And so trying to find that balance is, is key. What were you going to say, Klein? Yeah. No. So Ryan, I'm glad you touched on that because eating beforehand is something that people don't usually think about, especially, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I am not a dietitian. I don't know. I know some of the research, um, but not enough in terms of use for athletes versus non-athletes. Um, the concept of fasting, right. For additional use of, you know, fats, whatever you got to realize that your body is not going to be that specific, especially as you get into longer distances, it's going to start pulling sources from wherever that includes from protein. So it's going to start breaking down muscle tissue, which you're already doing. And I, you know, you said, Hey, I'm going to use the term damage. That's what happens with exercise, right? You damage the tissue. And then this thing that we're talking about recovery, you have to recover for you to get back to a higher level, right? If you don't recover, you're going to stay, you're going to either not get up as high as you were, or you're going to keep dropping down and keep doing more damage because that recovery is where you get faster, you get stronger. It's that it's the balance of stress and recovery that helps you get better and allows you to maintain. And I think you already addressed this earlier, um, just to pull this back, we don't have to go on this now, but that stress can be damage from an exercise. It can also be stress from things at work, things with family, things, personal stuff, your body, well, physical, mental, psychological doesn't always differentiate. And those can very much interact. So when you think recovery, make sure you think big picture of going, am I sleeping enough? Am I getting enough nutrition? And then also what's happening throughout my life and stuff happens, but you got to be able to go, Hey, maybe I might need to back off just because you can sometimes see things pop up during those times where everything comes together at the wrong time. So I'm really happy you talked about, sorry, going beforehand, just because had a lot of people that have tried fasting stuff before these very, very long runs. And if you're training to be able to do that, that makes sense. But for normal performance stuff, that's not always the best idea based on the dietitians I've also talked to where get some stuff in there so you don't start burning through other tissue, right? You want to be using glucose. You want to be using stuff that your body's meant to and not pulling out of other things that may or may not hampen your recovery after that run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, I really like um, what you said. To piggyback on that a little bit. Oh, go for it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I really like oh, you're I good. how it goes. Bold. <laughs> I want to bold italicize and underscore this because I tell people this all the time. You hit on something that's really important. You don't get faster if you're not recovering well. And, and the phrase that I use that I stole from um, Stacey Sims, she's a, she's a freaking phenom in terms of like female physiology. She's incredible. She said, you're only, what did she say? Your fitness is only as good as your recovery, right? So the fat, the better you recover, the more fit you will become. And underscoring the idea of keep it simple, sleep, nutrition, hydration, those you hit those A, B and C, those primo things, everything else does become important, but it doesn't mean a lick if you're not sleeping well, if you're eating, you know, like a two-year-old, um, like some two-year-olds anyway, or if you're not hydrating well. Um, so you get fitter when you recover well. That's massive. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, we were talking a little bit about muscle damage earlier um, and recovery. And I think that does bring up a really important point talking about a running schedule. Because a lot of people talk about a recovery run. Like, what what is a recovery run? Um, a lot of people take off days to recover. Should we have off days? And a lot of people, if they're a little bit more seasoned, they're doing workouts and they're running hard on specific days. And how many should we be doing? How long should we have in between said sessions of hard efforts? Sorry, that was loaded. That That's super loaded. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I started smiling. <laughs> um, Just give yeah, the classic so, PT answer. It's going to be, it depends. it depends. So you're in my head. You're in my head. In a, in a podcast room full of PTs, I was absolutely thinking like, oh, man, it depends. It depends. And that, yeah. is, that is so, like, God, we lean on that so hard as PTs, but it's true in this case especially. Um, it does depend. Um you know, how often should we be running? Well, it depends. Like, are you new to running? Have you not been running consistently in at least six months, right? Then you probably shouldn't be running like six, seven days a week, right? Um, what does a recovery run look like? Well, for somebody that runs a 230 marathon, that recovery run looks different than somebody that runs a four hour marathon. Um, how do we, as, as coaches, as PTs or providers of runners or forerunners, how do we standardize that? Um, I don't know that we can fully, but to answer those loaded questions, one of my favorite things to lean on in terms of helping runners understand their own bodies a little bit is rate of perceived exertion. All right, and, and kind of helping them understand that yeah. scale, that zero or one to ten scale of here is very generally what a one is is like, and here is very generally what a ten is like. Right, ten, you're you're sprinting all out, you have no more physical effort left in you, and you can't maintain that for very long at all. One being like you're you're taking a, a saunter down the sidewalk in your neighborhood right? Like your heart rate isn't elevated, or maybe even you're just sitting on your front porch, right? Your heart rate is at its baseline, more or less. Um, so what is a recovery run I'm trying to use this RPE to standardize this conversation across multiple levels of abilities? I like folks and, and some people might differ. Uh, but I like folks for their to have their recovery runs around that like three level effort. Very meaning very easy. You two and I could be holding this conversation while we're running together, presuming that we're all at the same level of abilities, yeah. which I don't believe that's true. But presuming we're all at the same level of abilities and maybe we test out really close on our, our you know, VO twos and, and other physiological markers. Um our threes would be pretty darn close to the same, you know, if we're getting all the same sleep and yada, yada, we can go down that deep, dark rabbit hole if we want to. But, um, so three is the answer to that question. What does that mean? What does that three mean? Again, very easy. We're able to talk to each other. We can have a full conversation and we're not running out of breath when we do it. So again, for someone who's a two thirty marathoner versus someone who's a four, that three looks very different on the watch or on the data. Right. How often yeah. should we run? And it, Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say in the running world, too, a lot of people call it the talk test. Can you talk? Yeah. Can you hold a conversation? Like, if you're like panting and you're trying to say your words, you're probably running a little too hard on that easy mm -hmm. day. Yep. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I think that no. was a little internet thing there, but I'll, I'll let you. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Uh, that, that is the talk test. Um, my strong opinion is that way too many runners run way too many of their miles at way too hard an effort. And that is the reason I have a job treating runners, trying to keep them out of injuries. Like Chris Johnson, who, who is a, a big mentor of mine is like 80% of runners spend 80% of their miles running way too hard when it needs to be the inverse of, you know, most runners need to spend most of their miles running very, very easily. Um, so I encourage everybody to try and lean into that. It's a hard thing to learn when you're used to running at what feels like a six or a seven. Most of the time it is a difficult thing to learn, 
but that allows you to recover for those harder efforts when they do come. So, and, and Ryan, just for the listeners, when you say the RPE, what, what scale are you using? Are you using like zero to 10? Are you using the one, I can't remember, is like four to 20? Which one, which one are you using? Just so people understand right, so what, I, what the, what a three might mean. Correct. There, there are a couple. If you, if you just hop on the Google machine, um, I use the one to 10, um, version because there are different versions and they have different research behind them. And, and in my mind, just in terms of talking to someone about it, one to 10 is way more simple to conceptualize than something like the Berg. I think it's, is it the Berg scale? It's like four to 20 or, or yeah. something like that. It's like, you're yeah, going to have me run something like that. a four to 20 scale. What is that? So, yeah, that's not uh, the easiest thing to interpret. <laughs> it's not, it's not. Especially so as a lay person. <laughs> for sure. And even as a professional, you're still like, what the hell does that even mean? Um, so one, that one to 10 scale is, is my preference to use. That's just the easiest thing to conceptualize and even simple, simplifying it further. That talk test that you were talking about, David, like if you can't have a conversation during your easy run, then you're running way too hard. I agree. So taking this another step forward, a lot of people after their runs, they're using different kinds of tools and mechanisms for the proposed mechanism of recovery. And where I'm going with this is you have a lot of products out there, let's say uh, vibration, percussion products, um, compression, whether it be a sleeve or rock floss, things like that. What are, what's your take on recovery tools? Do they work? Should we be using them? Um, and yeah, what, what's your take on that? You're just full of loaded questions today, man. I'm into it. Um, it's my specialty. I just, <laughs> I just get straight to he, it. He, he does do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, oh, I, man, I, I just ripped the band-aids off. Like, <laughs> that's all right. I would love to have multiple patio beers about all of these conversations. <laughs> be lovely. Dude, I'd love um, to have them. If I'm in Denver, I'll hit you up. <laughs> please do please do I'll, I'll talk all day about this stuff um so are those tools useful i think is the first question and in my mind yes they are um do they serve a purpose in recovery yes they do i think they are very often overemphasized in recovery in lieu of those items we discussed earlier that cannot should not be exchanged sleep, nutrition, hydration. Again, if you're not nailing those as consistently as you can, then all the foam rolling, the compression, the whatever tools that we're about to talk about, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It just doesn't. It makes you feel better for like five, 10 minutes. And then you get to that next effort and your body slowly starts to feel more and more like garbage because you're not hitting those high ticket items. So, I'm a big fan of the recovery tools. I don't, I don't want to knock on those at all. I think they're massively overemphasized um, just because they're the easiest thing to see and the easiest thing to demonstrate in, in our world in time of, of social media and quick information and, and quick hit stuff. Um, I think compression definitely has a place because there's research to suggest that it does help with microcirculation and all of those things. Um, I think Taping can help in certain ways too. Um, vibration, you know, everybody's, you know, asking for massage guns for Christmas and birthdays and things like that these days. <laughs> I just had a 13 year old athlete, uh, she's 14 now, I guess, 14 year old athlete get one for her birthday. She's really talented and, and works really, really hard. I'm like, wow, I, okay, that's a thing because that's the level to which people value these types of tools, like 14 year olds are getting them for their birthdays. Um, now that 14 year old athlete and her parents and I also had multiple discussions about sleep, nutrition, hydration before they decided to make the jump on that tool. <laughs> so loaded question, are they valuable? Yes. Do we overvalue them? Also? Yes. Can they be helpful for most athletes? Also? Yes. It's always helpful to think about what does each one of them do, right? Because a lot of times 
the way they're advertised is like, this is a catch all, this is recovery. And you got to think about, all right, so how, how so, right? So we know when in terms of tissue regeneration, tissue recovery, whether it's brain or the body, we know what sleep does. It's the primary thing that's going to do that. We know that nutrition, why is that important? Because that's giving you the building blocks to be utilized during sleep or during when you're awake to start building that stuff back to help you truly recover. We know the running schedules that we've talked about, right? They're going, how long do I take, right? Because it's about how much damage has been done and how do I make sure that that stuff can like, because activity, active recovery is a thing that can actually facilitate blood flow, help recovery, help get the tissue moving better because you don't want to get too stiff. The other thing is you got to ask, what is this doing, right? In terms of vibration or percussion, yeah, you can use it to modulate the tension of muscle tissue because that's it's a neurologic response, right? One of the things that we our bodies adapt to is vibration, right? There's light touch, deep pressure, vibration. So you can definitely get something to relax. That makes sense. When it comes to compression, like you said, facilitating blood flow, right? In terms of the microcirculation, that totally makes sense. The taping, right? In terms of maybe facilitating a better movement pattern, how much it actually does with blood flow. As much as I want to, I don't know. I've seen the spider tape. I've used it. I've seen it. I don't know the evidence on how, what it does, but I know from a neurologic standpoint, it can really be used to facilitate emotion, facilitate. Yeah. right? But you got to ask yourself, right? If we're going back to the taco burrito analogy, what's the most important parts of those, right? If you have like, you know, I'd say some of these things are kind of like the additional add-ons, like, you know, some parsley or something like that, some, some stuff like that. Um, I don't know why I can't think right now. I have a Who bunch of other like, give me some other add-ons. So you, hey, you, you know what? Like, I'll, I'll you don't take put, it. You, you know don't what? put parsley I, on parsley. a taco burrito. Someone help it's, me. It's the cilantro, Jeez. the onions. Yeah, cilantro. There Cibollas. we go. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my cilantro. Goodness. That's the word, not parsley. <laughs> <laughs> whatever um a lot of these things are like cilantro it tastes great right but is it the biggest thing right so if you don't have your tortilla if you don't have your meat or your base if you're if you're vegan or vegetarian right if you don't have that foundation it's not a taco or burrito right so yep. no one just wants to eat straight cilantro that's not going to help you i mean kudos to you if you do i don't know how you do that but <laughs> you got to have the Probably big parts first the then maybe you could start adding stuff on Oh, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Today's lesson, Matt doesn't know what cilantro is or can't remember. <laughs> what do you put on tacos again? What what's uh <laughs> what is a taco? Let's uh let's do that as a podcast topic. Um, no. Well that's awesome. I I mean, I love all of this, whether it be the tacos or the recovery talk or the burrito talk. Um, if I'm taking a look at it from a big picture here, just looking at some of the main takeaways and looking at some of the key tips and how to recover best, we were talking about it, but it really sounds like the meat, the bread, the butter, like all of this, it's the sleep, the nutrition, hitting the big things first, making sure that you are the best you from a metabolic and physiological and hormonal standpoint. And then everything else has its role to help facilitate along the way. What am I correct in that summarization? One thousand percent. One thousand percent. And it's hard. It's really hard, especially when you're not in the habit of certain things. Um, whether it's pre run meals or sleeping well enough at, at decent hours for yourself, it's really difficult to make those shifts. So I'm not trying to paint a picture of like, all right, everybody just you know, hop in bed and get plenty of calories and lickety split, you're going to be fine. It's very much a process. It's very much all about like learning about yourself as an athlete and as a human and figuring out how your body does respond in certain environments and with certain stimuli. So I encourage folks to understand, take stock and understand what their lowest hanging fruits are. Like what's, what's the easiest thing for you to start doing now, right? Maybe it's having a little bit of something before a run, or maybe it's go trying to like start your bedtime process 15 to 30 minutes earlier than you typically do. Like small little steps time after time, like we know the story, right? Like small little steps time after time will eventually yield the progress that you're looking for. None of these changes happen in massive sweeping ways. They just don't, it's, it's not sustainable. So understand what your current 
hurdles are, what your current limitations are, where you can improve and pick something simple to start with, develop that as a habit and then on to the next thing and on to the next thing, so on and so forth. So you develop this really nice, robust sense of, of habitual patterning around your recovery. Then you can make use of all the fancy tools and buy all the like cool stuff that you want to help yourself recover. Man, beautifully said. I especially about habit. I think forming. that's a wrap right there, my my guy. Man, that is <laughs> wrap up that burrito. Yeah, that is a burrito wrapped awesome. double. <laughs> cool. Well, man, um, that was awesome, Ryan. Um, so for all of our listeners and our viewers, where, where can we find you? What are your channels, your handles, uh, your place of work, if anyone wants to reach out to you for those things? Yeah, thank you. Uh, most easily found on Instagram at Long Run Physio. Also on Facebook under the same, but I don't spend a lot of time on there, to be quite honest. Um, longrunphysio.com is my website. And then uh, I work out of a gym near downtown called Fitness in the City. Um, so I'm, again, I'm two blocks from the Capitol building. So if you need any help, please reach out. I'm really responsive on Instagram, uh, longrunphysio at gmail.com. So just reach out if you have questions about anything, happy to help. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you so much for coming on. And we really appreciate anytime we could talk to another physical therapist. I mean, we're all like all one of the same, right? Like our brains are just so tightly wired together. So it's so fun to do that. We all say it depends. And if I'm in Denver, I will hit you up for that porch, uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that porch conversation. Um, but yeah, thanks again for coming on. And um, for our listeners, this is the Doctors are Running Virtual Roundtable. You can find us on pretty much anything now. I mean, we've got LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Do we have a TikTok? I think we might have we a TikTok. We do have a TikTok. I think Bach might have made that. Bach would like me again to emphasize that we have a phenomenal <laughs> LinkedIn that is growing at a fast pace. But obviously, yes. all the other yes. social media <laughs> channels out there, we've got a Strava group, all that kind of stuff. So. Let us know if you ask, a, if you feel free to send questions. We've got some great ones and we're actually starting a little thing where people that send us questions, we're going to start, if it's okay with you, we'll ask, but creating posts about being able to address that stuff because people are, are asking great questions. We want to be able to answer them, but we don't always get them in time because if people forget, we're also full-time clinicians and doing lots of other stuff on top of this. So we're trying to create some resources for people. So if you ask a question, just let us let, just know it might take a second. We'll try to get back to you. Yeah, I agree. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. That's a wrap for today. Thanks for having me on, fellas. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for coming on.